All right, everybody, welcome back to the Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel. And we have a very special guest with us today, uh, Mr. Mike Glover. Uh, before founding Fieldcraft Survival, Mike was in the military for 18 years, served as a sergeant major in the Special Forces, and was deployed multiple times to various combat theaters. He's widely considered an expert in counterterrorism, crisis management, strategic planning, and the psychology of how our Mindset can determine our success or failure in stressful situations. I personally threw that last one in there because after listening to his content, I kind of think that's how he's going to help us out on this podcast the most today. Mike is also the host of the Fieldcraft Survival Podcast, and he's got his own podcast called Mike Force. And he's been a guest on, he's kind of run the, the gamut from Andy Stump's Cleared Hot, Jocko Podcast, Free Range American with Evan Hafer. So if you like what you hear from him today, there's lots of other places that you can go see his stuff. So first of all, I really appreciate you taking the time today, Mike. Thank you very much. No, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So listen, I have all these questions and I spent a bunch of time prepping, but before we go anywhere, I got to hear about the mule deer hunt. Uh, epic. That's like, yeah. if I could sum it up in one word, it's epic. It's, um, you know, um, mule deer are super elusive um, in a lot of places, I come from uh, northern Arizona, where hunting mule deer is an, an almost an impossible feat. If you do, then you're in a small group of people who have have tackled that and have succeeded. And so, mule deer personally is my favorite uh, species of game. And man, I, the whole entire experience from the weather, the location where he, he was uh, harvested. Um, the shot placement, the ethical kill, the process, everything has been, I mean, that whole thing was uh, very impactful for me. And so, yeah, it was super exciting. No, that's awesome. I, I, I loved it. And I love kind of watching along and I like the kind of content that's been leaking out um, kind of post hunt. A lot of what I'm trying to do with Mindful Hunter, some of it's modeled after what you're doing at Fieldcraft Survival. So it's nice to see the addition of hunting content because I really do think it just pairs so well with the whole preparedness genre. Yeah. It's a, I think one of the fields, including hunting is a Trojan horse for preparedness yeah. and, and more so because the risks are higher. I mean, the statistical probability of you potentially getting into a bad circumstance and it ending great is not really good when you look at hunting accidents or people getting lost and uh, even predatory attacks. So all of the things that you, need to be prepared for culminate in a hunt, especially if you're paying attention. And I, and I love the fact that it, it correlates to something that's a personal passion of mine as well. Yeah, for sure. And it's kind of funny. I came into hunting a little bit later on in life, kind of, you know, early mid thirties, but I'd spent 15 years as a forestry engineer in BC, which is just, you know, you get dumped off in a helicopter or hike up a mountain and you're basically an old growth forest, 10 hours a day, five days a week, looking for timber, recce and stuff. And so I, uh, that, that background in like how to go out into the mountains, stay safe and get home and then take my crew with me every day. When I transitioned over into hunting, it was almost like a cheat sheet. Like I almost like leaped over some of my contemporaries because even if you had the hunting tactics and the hunting skills down, if you don't have the rest of those ancillary skills, especially when you start getting into the back country, like it's just a whole different game. Yeah, well said. I think the best hunters are those with uh, similar type experiences in austere and, you know, s somewhat unrecognizable environments compared to urban sprawls and, you know, suburbia. So it's like if you if you've been in the woods, you understand it's not anything to take lightly. You have to be planning contingencies for everything from weather to injury. And then you take that and then you take a hunt. It's like the most exciting because you're the safest you're going to be. You understand the woods, you understand land navigation, contingency planning, and it makes the overall experience that much more impactful because you could focus on the experience. I think most people who focus on this experience, they kind of pushed aside all those considerations uh, when they're not paying attention to it. But likely they're they're going to be the ones that are hurt the most um, and, and most likely the victim of their circumstance because they're not paying attention. A hundred percent. And I like to look at it like this. I consider focus to be a finite resource. And if you're uncomfortable in new 
surroundings and circumstances, a lot of that focus is going to be directed towards where do I put my feet? How do I walk around? Should I go up this hill? Where's the safe water? And if all of your focus is just on that, like, how do I actually get from A to B and stay alive? There's very little left to actually focus on the task at hand. And I think if people really dive into that, those ancillary skills and get that, they would be shocked at how much extra focus they have left over for the actual task at hand. And the rest of that shit just takes care of itself in the background. Once you get to that, that place where it's second nature. Yeah. Interesting. Um, that's, that's completely true. And people don't realize like even just walking in the woods, oh. if you just say, Hey, I just walk in the woods and that's what I do. Well, you're going to make mistakes because you're probably not lock stepping on inclines. You're probably not tying your shoelaces, right? You're probably getting blisters. You're not paying attention to all these small things that compound themselves in hunts into potentially catastrophic things. And like, I want to be able to enjoy the experience, but likely if you are enjoying the experience and you don't have that background and preparedness, um, then you're just blowing things off. And so there's, I think the coolest thing about hunting period is the journey and preparation um, because it's the one thing that just like in combat, you know, just like many things in life that you could be successful at, you'll see the return on investment um, tangibly in, in real time um, present itself when you break that shot clean or, you know, you're, you're, you're packing the animal out and you go, man, if I didn't do all those things right, it wouldn't have led to my successes. And there's definitely a correlation between doing things wrong and not being successful, which I've made plenty of those mistakes and can attest to. 100%, man. Okay, so so let's get into some actual questions here. So historically, a lot of the interviews you do, they kind of focus on your military career because to be honest with you, it's absolutely fascinating. And as curious as I am about it, I don't feel qualified having not served and I don't really live in that world to like dig into that. So there's kind of three specific areas I'd like to focus on. Number one, transitioning out of the military and into becoming an entrepreneur. Area number two, building the community at Fieldcraft. And then area number three, the, you know, the three pillars of preparedness. And I'm sure there's going to be some overlap between all three of those topics, but is that, does that sound good to you? Yeah, it sounds refreshing. And um, yeah, looking forward to it. Okay. So, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure you were working for an OGA in Pakistan when you kind of hit your wall and you kind of had your moment of clarity, if you will. And you're like, enough is enough. And then you kind of went through some steps and we'll jump forward. You create Fieldcraft Survival. Now what, I'm an entrepreneur myself and I spent a lot of time helping businesses start up and doing other such things. What I'm particularly curious about is if you could voice over, like, how did you come up with your unique value proposition? Like, what actual things did you go through or what processes did you do before you landed at, you know, the genesis of what then became Fieldcraft? How were you able to uncover that for yourself? Yeah, it was definitely mistake driven. I mean, a, a lot of the things I was doing, um, were very tactical in nature where uh, I was at, you know, I was on the ground and I'm the marketing guy and I'm the media guy and, you know, I'm the CFO and I'm this, you know, I'm the leader of the company because it's me and another guy. So it's, it's real easy to kind of be in an adaptable position where I, I tested a lot of things. Um, one of the, one of the most significant elements of the business. Um, and I think for many businesses, is the access to a free market and social media. Right. But, you know, a lot of people, legacy businesses are entertaining this proposition late in the game and they're going, whoa, maybe we should pay attention to social media because we've been getting away with periodicals and snail mail and that doesn't work anymore. So now we have to pay attention. Well, when I, when I left the government, uh, when I left OGA and, and the military, I hadn't had social media the entire time. So for me, it was a new uh, opportunity for me and, and something that I was very uh, fresh out of the gate with, which was good and bad. The good was um, I didn't have bad habits. I wasn't married to some specific way. 
And the bad was I, I didn't have the experience to understand how it worked in the first place. So the first year was, hey, let me put this out and see if it works. And I started building conditional habits that would lead to success because I was doing the right things more than the wrong for a consistent period of time, which I still do. And, and you know, when I, when I look at why, like my business right now would be considered successful, it's because I was doing the right thing more than the wrong for a longer period of time than anybody else was willing to do it. So all these businesses that started with me, that we were supporting each other, or that might have been direct line uh, competition, eventually fell off or petered out because they stopped doing that right thing more than the wrong. And, you know, it's a myriad of mistakes that I made over over the years, but I mean, it, it's an incredible journey as well. No, that's fascinating. And I love this concept of just doing the right thing more than the wrong. I was watching a movie the other day about a, a card counter. And like, that's the whole thing. You just got to have 51% wins and make sure that that your your bets are, you're managing your bets so that you don't blow your whole stack on one of the losses. But if you can handle the math, as long as you just stack up more wins than losses, you are going to eventually pull ahead. And I like that because it also it also gets at this, this hesitation. I find, I got some questions about this later, but I find a lot of people are letting perfection get in the way of good enough, especially when it comes to content creation and, and having a voice. And I don't think there's, there's no teacher as good as experience. And until you start putting stuff out into the wild and seeing what sticks and what doesn't, you, you're kind of wasting your time because you're really just playing in a sandbox without any real consequences. Yeah, the a lot of people are married to ideas about business, but that that's very different from the ground truth and the reality of how difficult it is to run a business. And so what I found is characteristics like adaptability or it not just being married to your ideas. I mean, when I started Philcraft, I started with one product and the value proposition for me was education for free. And I figured okay. if I just provided, like, like I was taking a completely different opposite track of most of my competitors. In fact, I can't even name one that was similar to my mindset, which was I didn't feel comfortable with compartmentalizing tactics and saying, if I'm teaching tactics, I'm going to break it up into a business model. And if I'm teaching you on day one and I'm withholding information that could potentially save your life, that to me felt unethical because when you put things into a business plan and revenue is part of that stream, you got to make money to continue the business. It takes money uh, to make money. So when you partition out tactical training, for example, my competition was saying, hey, this is part one. We're not going to advertise anything about what we're teaching. We're going to close hold that information and, and even be arrogant about it. And then if you want to get part two, you got to pay to play. Well, my thing was, why don't I just tell people that all these tactics are important to communicate and I'm going to teach you over a podcast, over social media for free, understanding that most people want the experience. And if they want to level up or they want to gain the tangible experience, then they're going to come and train with me. And so I did that, um, <laughs> received a lot of hate for it from competitors, from people who are like, I, I can't believe he's given the secret sauce. And I'm like, there is no secret sauce. And even if there is a secret sauce, it's better to communicate it, understanding that people are going to uh, want to get in the fold to actually do the training in person. And it and that led to a, a vertical, which could be a separate successful business in training. I mean, my training business by itself is a successful business. So, you know, reflecting on five years of that grind, I'm glad I stuck to that value proposition and that methodology because it's paid off years later. So this is fascinating to me because you've kind of hit upon the holy grail of, of content marketing and content generation while you were on the other side of the world and not even being really exposed. Like Gary Vee has this book, Jab, Jab, Hook, which is essentially exactly what you've just described. Give, give, ask. And it's actually more like give, 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 ask. And it's all about deliver value first, capture value second. So 
I think it's particularly interesting that you kind of came at it through an ethical back door. Like it was not first and foremost a business model in order to generate revenue. It was the fact that the subject matter that you were teaching, you didn't feel that it was appropriate for a more like traditional mode of deployment. Yeah, I think, you know, I take a lot of that from operational experience, uh, whether it was combat or, or nation building, for lack of a better term. Um, when you go into an indigenous area where you are the foreigner and you're trying to build familiarity amongst each other, um, you have to build rapport. You have to find um, value in, you know, common things that normal human beings are conditioned to respond to. And then when you build that relationship, then you could potentially ask. I, I am not a salesman. So I, I, at no point, even today, I'm very bad at selling swag at my courses, even though we could do two to $3,000 in one course of hats and t-shirts alone, because I, that's not me. I'm not driven that way. Um, I would rather give it away. I, I just, I, I feel dirty in that whole proposition. So the value of me just communicating all of the things that I've learned along the years was easy for me. And even to my detriment, it was harder for me to ask where it's like, well, Mike, we're not going to make our bills this, this month. If you don't start asking like, this is a business, this isn't just a, a charity. And so I went, man, okay, I have to strike the balance. I'm still yeah. poor at that balance, by the way, because I, I do more giving than asking, but it's just my nature. And, and I like that culture in, I mean, all my guys, whether it's, you know, 20 subcontracted trainers that teach tactical, my survival instructors, that's ingrained in them because my philosophy is you're, we're providing something more significant than a revenue transaction. It's about mission. It's about purpose. Uh, it's about community. And and that goes a long way. I feel like if you take care of people and they find value in that, they're going to take care of you. Uh, some people will never buy any of the equipment or any of the things that we do, but they want to wear the hat or the t-shirt because they stand behind the similar values that, yeah, exactly, that, that other people um, in the company or myself stand for. And that's how I navigate my own business. Um, I mean, like the hat that I wear, the Black Rifle Coffee hat that I wear, I don't just wear this hat because I like Black Rifle Coffee. Um, I wear it because I'm friends with Evan Hafer. Um, I believe in the culture. I believe in the community. And that brand has brought social equity to that business. And I think that's the most important thing that a lot of people obviously don't even consider when they do a business plan is how am I, how am I buying into, how am I building social equity? Because that capital is is not definitive and more significant than a dollar amount. A hundred percent. And we're gonna we're gonna dive into that in a moment, actually. Um, one thing I'm curious about with such a drastic shift in your day-to-day, -day, did you ever have any issues? Did you find it hard to cope? Like you hear stories about all the time, man, guys get out and they have a real hard time acclimatizing. What was that like for you? Or were you just so buried in field craft that you were able to like, just kind of keep your head down and push through it? Yeah. I look, I was even in the military, I, I was known for having kind of a radical work ethic because I prioritized my job and my profession more so than any other thing in my life, even at the detriment of my relationships and my extracurricular time. Some would, some would say balance. So um, for me in transitioning, taking that work ethic and applying it to this was easy because I wasn't being shot at. I wasn't starving. <laughs> you know, I wasn't losing sleep. Yeah. So I could, so, so for me, it was very easy going, oh, it's not grinding. That's just, that's just working. And I'm not getting shot at. I don't have to go through selections. And I'm responsible for my own destiny. I'm a singleton. That's even better for me. And so, uh, I mean, there was transitional issues of, of these conditioned habits and these conditioned, um, you know, loss of purpose. But the actual day-to-day, -day, even today, is very easy for me. People see me and they go, dude, do you, are you sleeping? Are you like, 
like even Evan said, you look tired, man. Like well, that's just my grind. It's, and, and I don't know anything else. Right. Um, so it's not like, um, I thought, Hey, I was going to go into a window and just work really hard to, to be able to get the return on investment. That's just how I am. And if I wasn't working hard for Phil craft, I'd be working hard for something. Um, right. in my life. Oh, I love it, man. Were there any particular learning resources, you know, materials, mentors that, that really helped you at the beginning? And a part B to that question, maybe there weren't there at the time, but now that you're deeper in the game, you know what types of things somebody in that period could utilize. Yeah, I, I hit up, man, I, even in Pakistan when I initiated the, uh, the thought or the idea of starting a company, I started immersing myself in books. And, uh, you know, a lot of the books I realized um, for somebody who didn't have any understanding of business were something that I could digest and, and was super motivated because I was like, wow, this is something new. You know, if I read a book on tactics or read a book on strategic warfare and nothing new for me, hard for me to be excited about not really learning much. But in this new world of marketing, I found a lot of correlations. So, uh, you know, even Gary V, um, um, man, there's, uh, there's so many, um, a lot of these books in marketing and media, uh, and, and even YouTube for dummies where I was trying to understand algorithms and systems and automation and, and paid advertisement. Um, I was brand new to, and so, man, I was digesting everything I could. I think the most important apparatus that helped me was social media because uh, with all the so with all the errors and the wrongs and the flaws of social media, I was able to connect to a whole bunch of good people who had experience that were able to help me, uh, including guys who were marketing guys, graphic designers, web guys that were like, hey, I don't know you, but I see that you want to start this. Let me help you. That is what made me successful. I didn't make myself a success. It was a collaborative effort with a lot of talented people that uh, allowed me to tap into their, to their minds and to their resources to make Philcraft what it is. Even the logo. I, I don't remember exactly how this uh, went down, but I gave a guy who was a graphic designer th the idea of what I wanted for my logo. And right. he made that for free and sent it to me. And I'm like, dude, this is exact. I cannot imagine a better logo than this and now in a lot of places in airports and places i go it's like oh well that's known as philcraft that's a good logo and and what i did was i built relationships with these executives and these business owners that i had on speed dial that i can call and say hey will i'm i'm about to potentially make a mistake run me through this and what this means those guys are still my friends today that helped me navigate these kind of um, difficult business issues that you will run into in scale. As you scale, you think your issues are there when you're small, wait until you get bigger. And it's just, it's just the same, but a different problem set. Yeah, man, this is, this is so intriguing. So I, I want to transition kind of back to this idea of, of building a community um, because it's, it, a lot of people don't realize, but the the business of building business today is the business of building community. It used to be about product development. And if you had the next Nike sneaker or whatever, you were going to knock it out of the park. Apple started to change the game. And then a lot of other people hopped on the ship. And I was listening to this podcast the other day and this VC investor had this, this quote, people come for the tool and they stay for the community, um, which I thought was really wise. Like you still have to have a tool. You have to have that thing that is worth people kind of engaging with you in the first place. But if you don't have that community behind it, you're not going to build that kind of like long-term relationship. And the other thing that fascinates me about Fieldcraft and a couple of these other, you know, I think Black Rifle fits in the same, the same category, but these, they're these brands with these incredibly strong cultures that kind of withstand the battering forces of everything that's kind of like going on right now. Um, so kind of how, like, was, did you think about that in advance and was that a game plan or was this like a, 
something that just kind of unfolded and you were just being honest and authentic. And the, the kind of follow up to that, I would love to hear the background about starting a podcast in your pajamas with an iPhone. Cause I feel like there's something in there that, that, that is behind the secret of Fieldcraft's success. Like your desire to just do it, just build it, just put it out there and have faith that it would, that would, would land for people. And I realized I kind of, I kind of went on there, but essentially the gist is yeah, that that kind of authentic development of a of a community. How did you approach that? Yeah, you, you know, a business nowadays is is decentralized in how it communicates with its consumers. Um, like if you own a brick and mortar store and you're the local gun shop, well, there's guys hanging out in that gun shop drinking coffee. The deputies come in on their lunch break. Um, you know the same people, the same faces. You know their families. Well, if you look at business now, it's mostly decentralized and communicating through virtual reality. Your cell phone, the email, the the newsletter, the podcast. And what I found it difficult to do was um, build a following with no relationship building. So when I when I first got involved in this, I I I started I started going on DMs, right? And I started answering every direct message that somebody sent me. So if they asked me a question out of guilt more than anything, uh, I would say, yeah, like you want to go to ranger school, here's some tips. Uh, you want to know the best EDC, here's my recommendation. So I realized that in doing that, I was building these relationships in collaboration or just reciprocating messaging and commu- basic communication. And so uh, it occurred to me that um, a lot of brands and businesses scale in verticals into a point in which they are soulless. They become soulless yeah. because it's a it's a it's a person or it's a group of people who have an idea based in passion. They develop this thing. They get a uh, capital influx. Their priorities or incentives potentially change. You get a board of directors, and the next thing you know that interpersonal relationship or community that uh, initially was the intent goes away. So now it's just about like a cheap purchase. So where I realized this was happening was all the feedback that I was getting from podcasts, from DMs was positive impacts on people. Man, you changed my mindset, man, you changed my life, man, you saved my life because I thought about this and I implemented this kit and if you didn't say that, it would it would have turned out bad. So I realized the things that we were doing wasn't just a business transaction, but a deeper and brighter um, side of business. I saw it in my mom. My mom had a beauty salon. Her first salon was her turning our grass dirt garage. It was a carport and pouring concrete and turning it to a one chair uh, beauty salon where everybody sat in that chair was interacting for an hour and they weren't coming to get a haircut because they can go to sports clips and get it for five bucks. They were coming for the relationship building to right. get things off their chest. And, I, and then I look at my mom and go, you're not a, you're not a beautician. You're a counselor. Right. right? So uh, where that scaled, where I went, man, this is something very different because I wasn't using comparables and contrasting uh, business historicals. I was going in my own scale, how can I double down on this? So I started doing in-person seminars, no ask, no cost, um, and, and seeing what happened. Then you get 50 people, you get a hundred people. I've had 300 people from my community show up. And then I spend an hour talking and three hours shaking hands. Right. And then I'm going, man, if, if this could scale, where you're maintaining the integrity of what this is, you're building purpose, but you're building a community that, like you said, will always support you in weathering the storm. I mean, when Shopify took down my account for unknown reasons, likely related to all of the things that were going on with the the, uh, elections, I sold $20,000 of my hat through Venmo direct pay, which is a lot of scrolling and clicking for people yeah in 12 hours so so i go man this isn't just um um philanthropy and doing good in the world this is how you build 
resilience in business. And, and people who don't get this likely have tried to build the thing and hoping people will come. And that typically means more capital, more resources, and a high risk of failure. The slower burn, which is what I did, was building an organic following and an organic community, one human being at a time. And I will never, people have asked me like, will you deviate from that? Because now you're a sportsman, you're going to be a best pro, you're evolving with Black Rifle. Will you deviate? Not only will I not deviate, but I'll double down on that because it's so important, especially today with the breakdown of the family, family unit the breakdowns of our communities and whether it's related to COVID or socioeconomic issues, we need that reinstated and sustained in our society. Well, and I would go one step further to say they're not deviations, but they're amplifiers because it's not a one plus one equals two. It's a three times three equals nine type of situation. When you align with other organizations and other brands that have similar goals and similar values and similar beliefs as as yourself, you get the cross pollination of, of, um, followers and, and all the rest of it. And I think, and people have a damn good nose these days. Like they can smell bullshit a mile away, but when it's done authentically and with like an honest desire for the community and some of these brand partnerships are going to, you know, benefit people like, you know, what if you weren't within a hundred miles of a field craft HQ or, or, or a black rifle coffee where you get some stuff now it's in sportsman's like, that's a direct benefit to the end consumer that comes through that, that partnership. Yeah, it just works, man. I mean, it just, I mean, Johnny Morris, when he started Bass Pro, the idea was I'm going to bring people in to teach people about these lures, these rigs, how to be better fishermen. And so there was a close knit engagement. And that led to building a very loyal brand following that supported the business through its entirety. And so I don't look, you know, Silicon Valley's looking and researching uh, cases like mine and Black Rebel Coffee because they're like, how do these guys get such a cheap acquisition of customers? Yeah. And then how do they sustain them through long haul? Well, we, we get cheap acquisition because we're not selling them anything. It's, it's providing value and we're sustaining them because we're providing a task and purpose that allows them to be part of something bigger than themselves. That was the same feeling of why I joined the military. And it's the same uh, creative um, development that I instituted in my own infrastructure because I wanted to feel like I was in special operations again back in the team room, not running a a binary ones and zeros business. I didn't want that. No, and and I think integrity is at the heart of it all too. And that's what makes it hard to replicate. You can't take what you did and then just institute a different subject matter and have it succeed because it misses the heart. Um, And that, that you cannot, you can't make out of nothing. It's something you have to authentically bring to the business or you just don't, you either got it or you don't. Yeah, for sure. And that saying that some, sometimes it bums me out because a lot of people that I, I'm either consulting for or I'm helping out with their business. I know. I know out the gate after talking to a person for a minute, whether or not they're going to potentially be successful in that particular model. And if they're not, you know, I'll be the one to, to tell them like, Hey, listen, there's, there's a couple paths here. You might want to choose, you know, Y instead of X. Um, but I think in looking at business and in looking at uh, my relationships with bigger companies like SIG, like Black Rifle, It's what companies need, Um, especially now. They need this level of resilience because like you said in initiating this conversation, um, people are not dumb. They want to recognize that the brands they wear or the brands they drink are affiliated with their same value systems. And I thought you can get away with doing that. and, And at some points I wished that I could, but the reality is, um, you can't. And, and if, if, if you tie in those values with the brand, you're building something that's unstoppable. And, and when I look at my own diversification, I got 10 contingency plans and, you know, I I have so many levels of resilience, um, that there is no fail for this business. And, and I know that because I deal with it intimately, that's not a bragging route, uh, um, 
right for me. That's just what I built over the years of being in business. Okay, this is this is a perfect transition on the topic of of resilience because I wanted to get in preparedness. Now, the three pillars of preparedness, as put forth by Fieldcraft, are EDC, mobility, and kind of safe home or, or safe area. But you also describe there as being like an umbrella or a ceiling or an insulation that is your mindset. And then the foundation of everything is community. And I think we've had a good chat about community. And I think before we get into the specific pillars, I think we should have a little chat about mindset. And one of the things that's always fascinated me, so you basically have this story early on in your your military career, you randomly got assigned as an 11 hotel instead of an 11 Bravo. And this essentially kickstarts this novel quality, like cycle of just unbelievable kind of horse shit that is like stopping you from getting where you, you want to go. And even when you tell this story, I don't, and, and you're, it, but it takes you years to get, it's almost like one of these like epic tales where like they go on a quest, like Homer, the Iliad, and it, it looks like it's going to be a straight line. But by the time they get where they're going, it's been, it's a decade later and they've gone 800 miles out of their way. When you tell this story, I hear you laugh when you tell it, you don't have a lot of malice. Now, maybe, maybe I'm wrong and maybe you were particularly bent out of shape at, at the time. But I'm curious about your mindset in that insane bureaucracy that a military must be. I don't know. I've never been in one, but from all accounts, and, and, and it sounds like one. How were you able to kind of keep an, a, a positive mindset and not just say, fuck you or, or just lose your shit and, and, and stay the course and maintain that commitment to your goal? Yeah, the... You know, I, the, the synopsis of the beginning origins of my military story were, were I had a plan and that plan didn't go to the way I wanted. And, but I also understood that there was benefit, uh, especially at a very young age, of, you know, 17 going in the military, that I had a lot to learn anyways. Um, so I, 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 I distinctly remember the periods of time where I submitted and said, Hey, you could either, you know, resent this experience, dwell on it and lose a lot of time, or you could double down and realize there's a lot of opportunity. So, you know, I took the latter and decided, Hey man, will I be a better green beret or, you know, CIA guy because, um, I have ranger school. Well, absolutely. Well, then I need to go to ranger school. Um, Ranger school wasn't in the the progressive path that early, but hey, man, I have an opportunity. And so I didn't want to derail the end states or objectives of the long term path with having a bad mindset in the beginning. Uh, That character trait for me was uh, adaptability um, because the adaptation is the number one characteristic in survivability. It it doesn't matter your technical skill sets how strong you think your mind is, how strong you think your body is. It has to do with your ability to adapt. And that leads to resilience. I I think mindset is resilience. Mindset for me is defined in what do you literally and figuratively do when when you're failing, when you're broken down, when you're knocked to your back, literally. Um, And and those next actions are going to determine your fate. So a lot of people don't have an understanding of that. And so when they get kicked down, um, they don't get up. Um, they, they do linger, they do dwell and they lose a lot. So I'm glad that experience for me was, was, um, was derailed, but that led to a lot of my successes in the future in hindsight, obviously. No, it makes a lot of sense. And it brings up the, the kind of concept of a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of see a nobility in a fixed mindset, like I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on my purpose and I'm, there's no, there's no bending of the willow, so to speak, but this, this ability to see, to have perspective that there, there's opportunity for growth or maybe a necessity for growth or these serendipitous situations that brought themselves about could end up being positive in the long run, I think is kind of key to that ability to kind of roll with the punches. Yeah, that's completely, I mean, I, Look, I, I, there was many instances in time where I was, I was either suffering or just not where I wanted to be. 
but I understood consciously that despite that, there was a broader or bigger objective. Um, whether that was a year from that time or even continuing right now, where I know there's different objectives that I want to attain. So it was me seeing the big picture and being conscious to that in the now so that I wouldn't get bogged down with what most people do is dwelling on the now to the extent in which they cannot operate and to, and to where they're immobilized or they're not willing to make uh, decisions or take risk. Uh, like I, I'm not, man, I, there's so many places that I didn't want to be in that time period that I understood would lend itself to being, whether it was my imagination of vision or creating an objective that ended up actually coming to fruition and going, well, oh, man, that, I'm glad, I'm glad I thought that way. And I've did that in different processes throughout my life in different phases where I, that same thing has come to fruition. Like, Hey, I know I don't, this isn't where I need to be right now. Let me suck it up, make the best use of my time and it will work out. And most often it has worked out. Okay. I want to, I want to draw an analogy, which might be somewhat comical between your time at the tomb of the unknowns and solo backpack hunting. So solo backpack hunting is my jam. That's where I am at peace with the world as deep as I can go, as long as I can go. And people are always curious about how to be, they always ask me how you get through it. And the funny thing is, it's like, it's not a get through it thing for me. Like that doesn't even enter into my head, but it occurred to me that the interesting thing about the tomb of the unknowns, which for people listening is basically this incredibly difficult, um, ceremonial assignment that requires extreme physical and mental discipline. And the difference for me between, and why it's particularly interesting is the contrast between that and combat is that combat's not voluntary to a certain degree. Like if you don't have your shit together, you're probably going to die. Where the tomb of the unknowns is, like you could just walk. No one's going to shoot you. Like, okay, there'd be consequences for sure. But you are agreeing to be in the moment. And it's the same as solo backpack hunting. Like, yeah, okay, if it sucks, you could just walk back to the truck at any given moment. So I'm wondering, do you have any tips tactics, exercises, like for people who don't have that level of discipline naturally, how do you develop it so that you can kind of force yourself to endure these rigorous circumstances, even when it is voluntary and you could just quit if you wanted to, and there would be little to no consequences other than, you know, letting yourself down and, and having to live with yourself afterwards. Yeah. I, a lot of people just don't know themselves. Right. Because they're uncomfortable with confronting themselves. So a lot of people, like when you talk about a voice inside your head, they think, well, well I have that voice, but I don't want to voice that I have a voice in my head because that maybe seems like I'm crazy. Um, what I realized very early in my life is the voice inside of my head could, with a right, rational, and logical uh, mindset, could keep me in the moment and disciplined without becoming erratic and, you know, neurological and then falling apart. And so when it came to quitting, um, it was nothing that was in me. I, I didn't, I don't even understand quitting because i just never have quit anything in my life because very definitively I've said to myself, if I want this quitting would never be an option. So that's what you have to determine up front. And foremost, because your level of resilience is based on the end objective and then your mind in that end objective. If you're all in and committed, it's like it's like expecting that a relationship is going to work out with intermittent commitment. Right. If, if you're going in half haphazardly, you're not going to succeed because you're not committing fully. But if you make the decision and you say, I'm committed to this then it makes all of the decision-making very easy mm. because everything that leads to success, you're on board. And then when you get uncomfortable, your options aren't the quitting sector of the decision-making plan. It's how can I figure out and navigate a way to stay in this um, for the most uh, long period of time that po I possibly can. So what I've realized is I created a happy place a long time ago in my head. And I use reverse psychology as part of that, where 
I say visually, because I have a great imagination as well. I think that's part of it. I say to myself, where would I rather be than physically uncomfortable here? Because it's sleeting or it's raining and the cold rain is going down my back and I'm, I'm very uncomfortable. Or in my mind, if I could create that place that's warm, that's, that's cozy, that's homely, I don't have to exist in the physical because in my mind, that's what matters. I would literally do that. And then I would say to myself, uh, in reverse psychology, I would say, man, it's super, let's say it's cold. I would say it's super warm and man, it's comfortable. It's like I'm underneath a blanket, but my physical body is freezing. And what I realized in going through selections and then being around uh, peers of not like-minded people where they were falling apart. I remember once I was standing in formation at Fort Benning, Georgia, 17 year old kid. And I was a squad leader and people started complaining about uh, how much they were suffering because we were in standing in the cold rain. And I looked around and I said, um, I said, dude, are you sweating? And one of my buddies was like, oh, what do you mean? I was like, it's hot in here, right? It's like, it almost feels like it could be uh, Hawaii. It's like, like we're on a beach. Like I'm starting to sweat. He goes, you know, I'm sweating too. And people started laughing, but they were like, yeah, yeah I feel, I feel warm too. And then all of a sudden everybody's like, huh. and they laughed. They probably got a, a dopamine hit and they're like, man, where my mind's at is where I, I want to be. Not where my physical body is. And I did that throughout my t- entire career where even if I voiced it, people psychology would immediately change because the alternative is they're digging the hole and getting deeper and deeper and deeper until they fall apart or they quit or they, they go into a sympathetic nervous response and fall apart. Um, that has helped me profoundly. Uh, one of the best books that I've ever read on kind of this concept is called the power of now. Uh, the power of now is understand the conscious place that you need to be right here, right now. That's super impactful because when you understand that, um, your mindset will change for living for the now instead of uh, expecting something else that's not going to change. Okay, so I want to take that and dig a little di- bit deeper on on one particular point. So you have these teachings on warrior mindset, and we talk about fight, flight, or freeze, and that once we are kind of neurologically or physiologically committed to one of those outcomes the kind of battle is already lost because whatever, you know, neurotransmitters need to be released or whatever sympathetic or parasympathetic chain reaction needs to occur is already started. And you're just, you're going to pass out or you're going to take off sprinting or you're just going to, um, you're, you're already committed to one of those ends. And I, I was listening to something you, you said the other day, and there's like a sliver of like awareness in between, you know, the circumstances we find ourselves and those chain reactions kicking off. How do you think about like increasing your level of awareness or maybe taking more control over the outcome before you reach that kind of point of no return when those chain reactions have already kicked off, so to speak? Yeah, it's a lot of the neuroscience behind it is the effects on the neocortex um, and allowing executive function or automation, they call it autonomic responses to take control. Your body wants, your body and your mind want to go on autopilot to preserve life, to, to, to get good outcomes. Consciousness, when, when I say consciousness, which is tied to cognition, simply means awareness. But it's also, it, it's also a parallel state where if you're thinking you're in the right state of mind to make decisions, to take in information and process it to help with those decisions. And you're not in an autonomic response where you're running on adrenaline and cortisol um, trying to save yourself. Because a lot of the primal responses are meant to allow us to save in a primal universe, an ancestral universe. So it's big and bold. It's mobility versus freezing and no mobility. So those are gross actions. What we need is specifically tethered to technology is co- cognition. We need the ability to dial 911. We need the ability to, to communicate our five W's. We need the ability to text our, our lat long. Um, we need the ability to think through more complex problems than the predator 
moving and closing the distance, right? So I think the most significant thing you could do is understand that if you're thinking in the first place, you are in a right place uh, to make to, to most likely succeed. It's why emergency procedures exist. It's why acronyms, uh, you know, uh, uh, during and post World War II became an aviation mantra because if we depended on exclusive executive function, we would fall apart, make wrong decisions in haste, and die. But if also we depended on just a diagnostic approach of following strict protocols, that could lead to bad outcomes. It's the balance of both. We need cognition uh, with the ability to uh, autonomically respond fluidly through a circumstance. So what I tell people is breathing. If you're thinking about breathing, you're in the right state of mind in the first place. So even if you say, hey, Mike said breathe, you're already there, right? I, what I tell people is, you know, the the, the ideas of, of building bad uh, habits on a range where you, you push a gun into the target, you break the shots, and then you race the gun back. The only thing you need to deactivate that um, let's just call it in layman's terms, that muscle memory that's going to establish a bad training scar or habit is to activate your neocortex by just thinking through something. It doesn't have to be thinking through a, uh, a, you know, a, an acronym that's going to save your life. Thinking about anything is going to do that. What people forget is when they're under stress, they stop thinking. And then what leads to uh, complex catastrophe is likely the absence of thinking, the auto, the trust and automation and allowing your body or your mind just to do what it does naturally. And then, and then the absence of tactics in the back of your subconscious to refer to. Cause if you say, if you're in, in a stressful situation or circumstance and your, your uh, consciousness turns around and goes, Hey guys, what do we got? And then it's crickets. Well, then it's easy to determine that you're basically going to follow the protocol, which is the sympathetic nervous response with no awareness, with no consciousness, with no cognition. And that, and you're going to just let your fate ride. Well, I just want to create the tactic. And then I want you to understand that if you're thinking, then when he turns around and goes, Hey, does anybody got anything? And that one tactic raises his hand and goes, I got something here that puts you in the right neurological state to, to lead to the best outcomes in survival. This is fascinating for me. So for my day job, I founded a behavioral economics consulting agency. And it's it's shocking to me how closely aligned what I do for a living is with this. So this guy named Danny Kahneman, he's this, he's this researcher. Uh, and this other guy, Amos Diversi, Diversky, they came out with this thing um, back in the 70s called prospect theory. And they basically, the nuts and bolts of it is, they boil it down as there's two systems. They and Kahneman wrote this great book called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. But there's basically two modes of thinking, system one and system two. And they're not real modes. Like these are, this is, you know, fictitious things, labels that we're going to use so that we can understand what he's talking about. System one is fast, intuitive, based on evolution. System two is conscious, cognitive thought. And they estimate about 95% of the time we're in system one, 5% of the time we're in system two. We need this from an evolutionary perspective because... System two thought requires like our, our brain is 2% of our mass and requires 20% of our caloric expenditure. Like it's a, it's a high fuel machine and conscious thought takes a lot of energy. So our body from like a, a survival perspective actually prefers autonomic responses because it's cheaper, it's easier, and it's quicker. And we've developed these heuristics or biases or rules of thumb that we just kind of click into and we go over and over and over. And a lot of what I do in the business world is like, okay, we're looking at a system. People are these automatons and they're cruising around in system one and we want them to take some kind of behavior. What type of intervention or what kind of thing can we do to kick them out of that system one into system two so that they stop for a minute, they aren't a victim of their cognitive biases and they actually you know, contemplate this decision that we want them to contemplate which is essentially the same, the same thing. Like it's the same responses that are going on just in a different, just in a different environment. Yeah. I, that, what you just uh, spoke upon is to me, self-awareness, right? Just the dot. Like I have this analogy with this uh, land cruiser, you know, me, me and Jack Carr and 
we got our land cruisers. We love them. Um, but they're not, the, they're, they're problematic. So what I've realized, you know, it's like if I gave you the keys to my 94 land cruiser and you weren't familiar with it and you're driving down the road and you saw uh, smoke from underneath the hood. And let's say you're five minutes from my house and you're going uphill in the mountains around Heber city and park city. You might go, Oh, this looks like smoke. This isn't good. I, I'm just going to send it. I'm, I'll, I'm five minutes away. I don't want to be stuck on the freeway. Let me go ahead and get to Mike's house. Well, then you pull down my, my road and right before you get to my house, you blow a head gasket. And then that's $10,000 of damage. And the, the, it's catastrophic. Well, if you understood underneath the hood, uh, even if I give you the education in that, and you were willing to take a look and you saw, oh, wait, this is smoke. Wait, that's not even smoke. That's steam. That, that's, that's just heat and water. And you pulled off the side of the road and you go, well, Mike taught me that, you know, if I saw this steam or smoke, he's got coolant in the back with a rag. And you get the coolant out, you lift the hood. And you realize the reservoir is not full and needs coolant. And you realize like, hey, if I touch this cap and it's cool to the touch, I could pop the coolant radiator cap, pour more coolant, fill it off, get it to a regular, uh, you know, a, a temperature that's going to be operational. And then you go, well, it all went away. And then you're back on the road. The analogy is obviously the hood is our, underneath the hood is our minds. When people don't understand how their minds operate, their default is allowing it to ride or I'm so stressed out and overwhelmed by what's happening physiologically that I'm just going to fall apart. That's the default. My, my mindset is if you just understand the basics, even the, in the uh, great example that you gave, what you will realize is a lot of the things that happen when they start, when your fingers start tingling, your palms start sweating, you, you respond in anger over something decisive uh, that's going to potentially save your life. You automatically start determining, hey, these are the symptoms. These are characteristics. I could mitigate this. And my, my goal and objective is one, if you're in a sympathetic nervous response and fight, flight, or freeze, I want you conditioned using the chemistry to elevate your performance, not falling off the map. And I want you to understand that if you don't have a, a determination where your red line is conditioned, you will not only hit the red line, but you'll go beyond the red line and potentially and catastrophically, uh, survival psychologists like John Leach in a study of survival psychology through case studies has determined that when you not, don't understand that, then you're going to be the 10%, the bottom of the barrel that most likely perishes in every major catastrophe, man-made or natural. So I want to keep you in the top 10% with just basic understanding and not at the bottom 10% where if you let it ride, you're almost guaranteed to fail where no matter how much conditioned resilience you have, it's not likely uh, being unconscious to lead to a, a good outcome. So I think that's a great segue because, you know, even with the perfect mindset in the world, you still do need tactics, you need systems, you need skills. So I think that's a good segue into preparedness. And I, I was thinking about it earlier today, and I feel like Fieldcraft has put the cool back in preparedness because... 10 years ago, a prepper was some dude in Oregon with like a bunch of baked beans in some kind of bunker. And he probably was not a very attractive dude. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> that was the, the mental image. And it's like, now you think prepper and it's like, you've got, you know, Amber and all these, like all of a sudden it's like, it's pretty legit to, to like, th th it's okay to be into that. Like you've almost given permission for the cool kids to come over and like play in this thing that was kind of like nerdy and dorky 10, 15 years ago. So I would like to hear for people who aren't familiar with preparedness or do have this really old kind of antiquated version of it. What is the, the field craft perspective for people who aren't familiar with it? Yeah. The first, um, the first thoughts for me in outlining a survival company was, was crushing and redefining the stereotypes of what that meant. Uh, which still, even today, with all the education and the things that we're providing, I, like I heard a Joe Rogan podcast with a guy recently, this is probably last year, pre-COVID, um, who wrote a book on preppers. And and even Joe Rogan on that podcast said, what did you, what, what did you find? Did you find that most of these guys were like wacky, 
they were insane. I, I'm sure like these guys were just crazy, right? And the author was like, no, actually, it's complete opposite. Right. What I realized is most of the preppers that I thought were going to be the most paranoid often are the most calm and reserved and not extreme. And 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 so he had, you know, and going and writing his own book, he had uh, his hypothesis and then realized that, man, I, I was completely wrong. And so I had to redefine it and termed it modern survival. But the question I asked myself was, how do special operations guys routinely go into the worst case scenario on purpose and come out on top? Like, if you think about it, they are literally doing uh, this thing called survival, but they are intentionally doing it. They're, they're going in and saying, hey, not only is this the worst target set, the most statistical probability of potentially dying, um, but we're voluntarily going to go into this circumstance. And so I went, well, the people like, for example, people think special operations and my job was dangerous. If you look at statistics, our job was one of the least dangerous things to do because you had the culture, the right. attention to detail, uh, ro ro robust contingency based planning, um, uh, uh, paying attention to equipment, service and support mechanisms that support the operator on the ground. So basically what I said is, man, if I could, if I could take what that is, a special operations unit or culture and create the civilian counterpart, then I would make people buy into a lifestyle of preparedness, not a hobby, not a one, one course, not a one piece of equipment, but actually making it part of their lives. I want, I don't want people to come to a course and go, that was cool. Hashtag about it and go, yeah, I feel accomplished. I want them to go. All of my recreational time, if invested in overlanding, hunting, and all these things, and I'm including this, this, these things Philcraft are teaching us, man, that's going to make me better prepared recreationally, but also it just complements my life because now I'm prepared and my family's prepared. That, that whole um, methodology is how we approach everything we do with Philcraft from training, from content, from equipment that I want. I, I don't want, I want customers to be all bought into the lifestyle of preparedness and not just a, 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 a t-shirt or a hashtag. hundred percent, man. So one of the reasons I reached out to you is that I would say even up until, I mean, me, even a couple of years ago, Canada was a place where a lot of people didn't really worry about losing freedoms. And we don't, we're not as loud about it as, as Americans are, but it felt pretty okay. But in the past couple of years between like vaccine passports and different legislation that just got proposed, uh, outlawing like duck hunting shotguns and just dumb shit that the federal government in Canada is doing. I think people in Canada are starting to wake up and being like, holy shit, man, like these things that we thought were rights no longer feel like rights. And some of the choices that we thought we had are being taken away. Maybe I want to take some responsibility back into my own hands for, you know, in case things do go south or whatever occurs, where do, where do you recommend people start? Especially if this is something that they're not previously familiar with, or they, they're not already in some type of community where there's a shorthand for these types of things. Yeah, I, that's interesting. And, you know, I'm refining that picture, uh, through our own company infrastructure as we speak. Um, the start point right now is getting familiar with uh, the understanding of what this even means, right? Because preparedness, it, number one, it's so broad, uh, it could be overwhelming. Yeah. Preparedness to me is not what you carry on your person. It's not specifically narrow in any one thing, but it starts with um, mindset, resilience, your, your own patterns of life, um, looking at your recreational activities. So there's so many things you can do without spending a penny. I, I, I enjoy, I mean, the reason I enjoy uh, being on podcasts is because I enjoy listening to podcasts because if I could hear, a, you know, the, your podcast, the Phil Craft Survival Podcast, I'm learning from a person who has a myriad of experiences, which will allow me to kind of digest specific things that are going to benefit me and my situation, because there's not an all inclusive um, version of this. It, it just depends. So 
what I would say is start with a podcast. My goal by the end of um, this year is to create the proper progressive structure of preparedness. That starts with our program that's called Responsible Citizen, which leads you into wethaprepared.com, which is virtual-based uh, engagement. Like, hey, guys, let me give you a block instruction on situation awareness. You don't have to fly to the U.S. You don't have to fly from state to state. You don't have to pay for a course. You get a block of instruction for free going, this is what situation awareness is, and here's why it's important. And then as we move down uh, the progressive scale, we go, oh, now I want to do in-person training. Right. And then I want to identify what are my weaknesses in my survival game. Again, a lot of people think it's like the EDC consideration. It's not even that. It's more likely natural disaster preparedness. It's more likely uh, preparedness in your, your potentially violent neighborhood. So that is a uh, learning management based seg- segmenting into physical training and then segmenting, I think, laterally with building out your capability. Like the, the idea that you could just take a whole bunch of YouTube videos and be better prepared is a lie. Special operations are the best in the world, but if it wasn't for their equipment and that reciprocation and collaboration with innovation and new ideas constantly, then they would, we wouldn't be the best prepared. So um, I want people to go, hey, I know now that I need to start looking at um, ways to stop the bleed. Oh, I need to get a, a a package or equipment that's going to allow me to stop the bleed. And then by the way, not only do I need to be trained, but I need to train my spouse and my kids. And that, and that is building capability and your capacity. If you're willing to take the the ride, understand that it's very, um, it's very tangible in many ways, because a lot of people are used to going to, to the retail store, the Bass Pro, they get the med kit. They never open it. They throw it in the trunk of their car and they go, I'm prepared. You're ill prepared because you should be breaking apart the equipment, training with it, making it a part of your life, and then a part of your community or family experience. And that's the nature of how we need to we need to do this for the future. Because if there's not constant engagement and collaboration, um, it's just like any business where you bite off the hook and then that's it. It's the transaction's complete. So one of the things I, I think that Fieldcraft has been particularly good at doing is not kind of permeating this this kind of male this masculine stereotype and you've got a couple particularly talented female trainers and maybe sometimes the best way into the home is is through the wife but let's say there's there's dudes like and they're seriously interested in this but they know that it's it's got to be kind of embraced by the by the whole family what type of advice or, or tactics do you have for those guys so that it's it doesn't come off as this kind of like stereotyped thing that is understandable why there's some resistance to it. Yeah. Look, the, the spouses training spouses is just never going to work because we, we have an idea of how things are supposed to be, but your spouse likely doesn't 100% buy into the, the, the agreements. So, you know, and we witness this all the time, especially with doing all women's courses like when I first started marketing all women's courses, I'm like, yeah, this would be easy. Like you just train women. Well, women um, in their mindset and their biology are completely different than men. Right. So the considerations are different. Uh, like, for example, like you could run a combatives course, right? And you teach men combatives. And then you have females in that course and they're, and they're learning combatives. If you take an Amber, she's 105 pounds, right. and you put her against me at 240, I it doesn't matter what Krav Maga, what you know, what belt, what, what level that person is at. Yeah. It, it, she is not going to be able to withstand a, a person of my size. Yeah. So even in that nature, the way that you teach a woman is completely different. The pistol for her is the balance between, um, her being outweighed or potentially outnumbered by, um, violent criminals. So one, there's a different vertical. So all of the things that a man might know or, or, or buy into, even like when I, when I, when I thought about rucking, like, yeah, I could, it's easy for me to put a 60 pound pack on and run or ruck 12 miles, 18 miles. But you take the same thing to your spouse. How is she going to do that? Again, considerations are very different. Take kids on top of that. And you're working with a new ball of wax. 
Right. So what I would look at as a family unit is try to build verticals with separate uh, skill sets that are complementing each other that makes everybody in your family an asset. Because when I look at people in the in, in, in analytical preparedness, is you're either a you're either a liability or you're an asset. Right. And and a a child under the age of five is a liability no matter what. A child between the ages of six and and sixteen could be an asset because they're more cognitive and they could do things uh, based on the communication and the development of their brain. So we understand that everybody has their own different vertical. Allow your spouse to train to get that level of training, and then bring it together and culminate. So you guys can work to better, uh, uh, better as a team, but understand that, hey, my my spouse might be task organized to protect the child, um, and her number one priority is getting in the vehicle when things are going bad, while I'm the shield, I'm the defender. If we understand that mindset and properly task organizing ourselves from the beginning, I don't think guys will get butthurt about, well, my, I'm sending my wife off to be trained by Phil Craft Survival. Because now, since we do have the Ambers of the world, we there, there's families that are in Fieldcraft that are getting their own vertical path and bringing it together in culmination, which is amazing to see. That that's like the hybrid and the best case scenario of like a family unit being best prepared. Is you go away, you do your own training, and you come back and work together as a family with your vertical of training. I love it, man. And it's very very military driven too. Like you got the comms guy, you got the weapons guy. Like everybody has their area of specialty, and everybody contributes value in their own way based on their own predispositions and kind of natural skill set. I think that's a, such a great way to look at it. Okay. I got a couple, I got a couple quick questions and then we'll let you go. Cause I'm, I, I know you're a busy guy. I know you have a deep passion for reading, especially older stuff. You, you brought up the power and now, but I was wondering if you had like a top three recommendations you could throw out. Yeah. So, um, uh, it just popped in my mind. Untethered Soul uh, is a really good book on a similar understanding of consciousness and, you know, men's, I mean, it's it's, it's related to, to women as well, but your kind of identity in this place on earth. It, it, it takes a step back in, in kind of the natural state of things and how uh, we best fit in the world. Uh, that's a great book. Um, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, um, a, a great book to understand that even the best in the world have done the work to be the best in the world. I mean, Tim, a lot of people confuse uh, Malcolm's statistics and and ten, it's like I've heard people say it's 10,000 reps. It's actually 10,000 hours, which happens to be a decade of experience prior to people becoming subject matter experts. And, you know, Malcolm references um, the Beatles, um, references Bill Gates. Like these weren't special um, people at the time. They were just more willing to put in the work over longer periods of time. And that turned out to be in reflection and in perception being the best in the world. So if you want to be the best, be willing to commit a decade of your life to being the best, not just. Hey, I want this instant gratification because I should be popular. I should be respected for my experience. It doesn't work like that. The only reason I'm in my position now to even be on this podcast is because I have 20 years of experience right. of doing it. Um, so that's why I could be a subject matter expert and it takes time. And um, man, there's so many uh, of my favorite books. Um, look, I, I, I'm a, an avid reader of military history through people who have lived those lives. Um, some of my favorite, like the mission, um, the men and me uh, by Pete Blaber, a great book for every leader. Um, uh, platoon leader, uh, a story about a captain in Vietnam that was with the 173rd, a, a, a must read for every young leader. Um, and I would say any Mac V. Sog book, um, if you want to have respect for the military, especially spe special operations and the Vietnam vets, read any of John Plaster's book, including Sog or Secret Commandos, because you'll understand what's what really surviving 
and pushing through adversity really means. Um, those are just a small list. Actually, on my personal Instagram, mike.a.glover, I do have a book list and story highlights that I try to update often that has some of my favorite books uh, in there. Oh, perfect. Um, Bear Essential Med Kit for Hunting. Bear Essentials is a tourniquet, a compression bandage with combat gauze or material. Um, one, a tourniquet, you're likely to see a potential catastrophic injury from an extremity that could cost you your life in the backwoods. And you don't want to be using your belt or ripping your t-shirt in half to save your life applying a tourniquet. Um, extremity wounds are uh, something that are very prevalent in hunting accidents. So you have to have a tourniquet. Um, the soft tee um, is a good tourniquet that's NAMT certified, which is this means it's been through the rigors of combat development and testing. And so is the CAT-7 um, made by North American Rescue. Uh, we sell both of them online. Um, and I would say the compression bandage with the combat gauze, which has the coagulant, will reduce the amount of material, but you need something to stuff into a hole to be able to stop the bleed with compression to be able to um, push the compression of tissue around that stuffed wound. And combat gauze, which has um, the coagulant in it, and a compression bandage, which takes up about a three by five inch space on your kit is a must have for any hunter who's going out and not forgot to mention communications, right? If you have an extremity wound because you've compromised um, a femoral artery or arterial bleed, you're going to have to get to a higher level of care. So you need the means of communicating. If you don't have cell phone service, you need iridium or some sat communication uh, in place of that. I would not go anywhere in the back country of any place, especially in Canada, where you could be somewhere where, where communication is not even thought about mm -hmm. without having the ability to text over the horizon or send an SOS of my whereabouts. 100%. Okay, final question. Special Forces gave you a unique ability to strategically plan, I would say, at that upper 0.1 percentile. What kind of tips or tactics would you give to people? Um, when it comes to hunting and when we'll think like something a little bit more severe, like a backcountry hunt, like we might have multiple modes of transportation. We might have lack of communication. We're going to have several days of, of food planning. What are some principles or things that you take into consideration when you're planning some kind of, of exercise like that, where there is le legitimate risk? I put everything into what's called a pace plan, a primary alternate contingency and emergency building contingencies and redundancy in systems that are likely to fail. So if I go commo um, and my primary plan is the SMS infrastructure uh, that's over the horizon through Iridium, through a sat phone connection. Well, what if that fails? What if it gets wet because it's raining and now I don't have that? I need alternate com uh, communications. So it might be another version of that. Uh, it might be um, it might even be in the emergency part of the E, the emergency, the last ditch effort. It might be a time and place like, honey, I'm going out for three days. If I'm not back in three days, I will move to this location. If I'm not physically there, something has gone wrong. Every 12 hours at this time, I'm looking to go into that window. And if I'm not there by day two, you need to call search and rescue, right? So we're building a contingency plan based off of servicing and supporting that contingency. A lot of people think it's easy to say, yeah, my backup plan is this. Well, if that's your backup plan, have you communicated that backup plan? Do you have uh, the infrastructure or the actual support that's going to back that up? Like if you say, if you say my primary means to fire is a lighter and then your alternate is hurricane matches, you better have hurricane matches in your ruck because right. that primary goes away you need to have the pace plan in place. So one, as a Green Beret, I was taught to contingency-based plan for everything, which is easy to say, but with developing the service, support, friendly communications, and uh, cooperation, that we understood that that primary was likely to fail, and we need a real contingency in place that everybody knows the plan, 
and they're going to react accordingly when that goes down. Um, and so I wouldn't even just say it. Like I wouldn't just brief my spouse. I would put it on an index card and like, honey, this is my pace plan. You understand exactly what this means. And if I go out in this hunt and this falls apart, you understand how to reference that. That's, that is my mindset. And that is my planning methodology in everything that I do. That is medium to high risk. Uh, I won't do it without that. Awesome. Mike, I can't thank you enough, man. This has been, uh, I'm going to have, this is one of those ones where I'm going to have to go back and, and listen to it again so I can actually capture all the information. I'm going to put links in the, in the show notes for where people can find you and um, how they can find Fieldcraft and all the rest. But a- any closing thoughts or, or, or where people can, can track you down or anything you want to you wanna pass on before we wrap things up? Yeah, just Fieldcraft Survival on everything. I mean, that's YouTube, that's uh, podcasts, all, again, all free content social media. My personal Instagram is mike.a.glover. Uh, we have we the prepared.com, which is the, the virtual learning apparatus that will scale and grow uh, this year. Uh, and I'll just say, you know, thanks to having me on the podcast, but asking very different and more intellectual questions about uh, the, the method behind the madness. I mean, often we're just, you know, we're just scratching the surface with a lot of things. I think it's important to have that conversation because when you get deep in the weeds, you better understand which better helps you diagnose and implement these things we're talking about in your own life. And uh, yeah, I just appreciate having me on. No, that was great, Mike. Thanks again, man. Wish you well. Yeah, thank you.